myself on the big screen. <laughs> okay, uh, hello everybody. Uh, it's fantastic to be able to uh, talk to all of you in Moscow. I'm sorry I, I'm not there in person, uh, but uh, hopefully soon enough, it would be fantastic. So um, today I'm, I'm going to speak sort of broadly about, uh, about interior design, but design in general too, and how it shapes our lives. And uh, what I'd like to start off with is specifically, whoops, whoops, sorry. <laughs> Are you there, everybody? Okay. I would like to talk specifically about uh, interior design specifically, but we'll talk about architecture, a little bit industrial design, everything. So the images can start. Are, are my images playing now? Can you run the uh, slideshow? So um, you can continue now. Let's go to the next image, please. Yeah. So. You know, I, my, I'm going to go back a little bit. Uh, my education originally was industrial design. It was my undergraduate and my master's was a general design program. I did my undergraduate in Canada and my master's in Italy. And uh, when I uh, started before design, as a, just even as a, as a child, I found that, you know, my father was a painter and artist and he was also a set designer for television and film. So he was very sensitive, let's say, to what one would call good design. And then, you know, it's a question how you define that. I think simply put, good design is generally when something or a space or an object sort of deals with the human experience in a seamless way. In other words, that good design is something that not only is inspiring and interesting, emotive, but most importantly, experiential, that it actually elevates the way you feel in everyday life. So that can be something very, very simple as a glass that you drink out of all the way or a bottle or a physical object, um, something that, let's say, has a, an, an emotion to it that makes you uh, feel something or something that's very functional, that when you open it or turn it or feel it or hold it, it gives you a sense of a better life, really. Brings more to everyday life. Um, so I always felt that uh, design was a critical part of everyday life, obviously. And um, my father was very particular about the objects that we had in our house. And I think I was inspired to study industrial design because I loved a little alarm clock radio that I used to have beside my bed that uh, as, a, as a child, I was, it was the most important object in, in a way to me. Um, and it was by Braun and it was an orange clock and it was a very, very nice uh, object. But it was also something else, a democratic object. And this is something I always believed in, that design is for everybody. Design is a democratic act. So design is not just a creative act, obviously. It's not just a, a social act but it is a democratic act and it's even a political act. And you could even argue, obviously, that design is an economic act, that in a capitalist world we live in, design creates, let's say, uh, need or demand or interest or desire. And uh, so it generates, obviously, a better economy for all countries, all places, and brands do the same thing. Anyway, so I started developing working in design and uh, when I started my own office in 1993 in New York, prior to that, I had worked in a firm in Italy and a firm in Canada. But when I started my own office, I was determined to be a, what I call pluralist. So to try to do design that's across all boundaries, because my belief was that everything that we touch in our daily lives shapes our existence. So, um, and that every object and everything around us actually is connected. And there is no, for me, a separation between architecture, industrial design, product design, fashion design, interior design. For me, it's actually all one because it's all about, again, let me reiterate this point about our daily lives and how these objects, things, spaces, cities, information, services, interface, all have an amazing impact on our well-being for good or for bad. If it's for good, it's good design, obviously. 
So as I started my career, um, I was about working for about seven, eight years when I was first asked to do a shop uh, for Giorgio Armani. Um, and uh, he called me up and invited me to Milan. And I was in New York. And I think he, the reason he called me up and, and invited me was he heard and saw some of the product design I had done. And he thought that I would um, be very good to shape his, at that time, his identity and his new interiors for the millennium, for 2000. So this was 1999. So I designed three shops for him. And uh, I'm gonna just briefly talk to about those shops that I designed for him. Um, but my idea was to show what's going to happen with the technological and digital age. Because for me, design is inseparable from innovation and inseparable from technology. And why? Because design evolves and progresses humanity. So I'm not interested in, in looking back when I design. I'm always interested in working in a contemporary context, in working with the issues uh, at hand and the problem solving at hand, but also with the, let's say, milieu of the time in which we live. The, the Germans call it the zeitgeist, the zeitgeist of the time in which we live. And the zeitgeist in which we live for today is a very technologically driven world. We could argue it's what I call, we're in a data driven movement, really. So one of the shops I designed for him was with no clothing whatsoever. And I was down in New Orleans and I went to an exhibition called Seagraph, which was always to show latest technologies. And at that exhibition, there was uh, huge, huge scanners, body scanners. And these body scanners, um, uh, when I was there, they put me, they scanned my body and they put me up on monitors and they actually plugged me into a Hollywood film as changed. So I became the character of the film. And I was so impressed by the technology. I thought this is the, this is really the future of shopping is that one day I could walk into a store, have my entire body scanned. And then just with touch screen, I could actually, and this is what I did with Giorgio Armani, is to take 30 years of its archives of clothing and I could drag them onto my body and, uh, and try on almost everything, but virtually, not physically. So I designed a store with no clothes in it whatsoever and uh, just body scanners and these huge monitors. That was one concept. The other concept I did for him was to make a runway in the shop and hire all the unemployed models, which many models you know, need work. So what they would do is they would walk around with the collection of clothes on them and walk up and down the runway. So every time you come into the store, you're sort of participating in a live fashion show. And, uh, and yet again, there would be no clothes. And at nighttime, I made all the glass of the facade in a liquid crystal polymer video. So that the runway from the day was just projected all night. So if you walk by the store when it's closed, you would see the runway of the day. Um, so they were sort of event shops really called experiential shopping. Now this was 22 years ago. So Giorgio Armani um, rejected both proposals because he said that he has to sell clothes. And I said to him, well, the idea is, is to show your brand how it's moving into the 21st century and that you would maybe get a special gold card, let's say when you come into the store and you go home at night and you type in your, your ID or your, your member ID, and then you could again try on, because your body is scanned, try on everything for money, and then you could order it online. But you know, ordering online 22 years ago was, was at such the beginning stage, at the abecedarian stage, that it was, I was thinking too far ahead, obviously. And Giorgio Armani said uh, that he didn't want to proceed with the shops. But what was important about one what I'm talking about was that the approach of designing the stores was not about decoration. It was not about uh, ornament or just making physical image, but it was really about speaking about the time in which we live and about Giorgio Armani and his, let's say, presence in the fashion industry. Um, but um, so they weren't successful. And, and after that, I got my first, uh, fortunately, my first interior design, which was a restaurant in Philadelphia called uh, Morimoto. And he was the famous iron chef in America at that time who won many television uh, episodes, cooking episodes. 
And he, uh, and I designed this restaurant and the restaurant became so successful that it allowed me to start getting more and more interior work. And uh, next after that, I did a hotel in, called Semiramis, which is in, uh, in Athens, which is still there. And interestingly enough, the restaurant is still the most successful restaurant of the restauranteur who owns it. He owns 12 or 13 restaurants. That restaurant I did is still the most successful. And the hotel is still exactly the way it was uh, 22, 21 years ago in Athens, um, which, which made me realize something actually. What it made me realize was when I designed those spaces, I wasn't looking or Google imaging competition. And this is a big problem. What we do is we are looking at so much imagery uh, every day. In fact, there's 1.4 billion images produced daily in the cloud. 1.4 billion. So, it, hello? Hello? Can you hear me? Something wrong? No, no, we can hear you. Okay. I hear someone talking. Sorry. Um, so, uh, at that time, what I focused on was the experiences, really focused on the experiences. So for a good example is with Morimoto Restaurant, I focused on the ritual of Japanese dining, the way the whole process is done. And I did it in a very contemporary way. I even took, let's say, some, some very traditional materials, but used them again in a very contemporary fluid way. I also saw for me that, you know, the, the pleasure of eating is a very organic experience. So I made a very, very organic space. We're not seeing the space here now, but when it comes up, I'll show you it. Very fluid space. I used at that time LED changing color glass boxes that divided the restaurant up into, um, into, uh, into groups so that no furniture could be moved. Everything was fixed. And because it was all fixed and divided by glass color, I made the seating that when you come and sit, let's say at seven in the evening, that for each course, the color would match the next course. So there was a certain color for appetizer, a certain color for the first dish, uh, for the uh, second one, a different color for the dessert. And so the colors worked with the food, the lighting worked with the food, the smells. And what I realized also when I did the restaurant was that the design is not visual. And this is our, our mistake in a way. We keep looking at things visually and going back to how many images are generated every day. If all we do is look at images and then we design, we're not doing something that's human, humanized and three-dimensional. We're actually looking at the world in a two-dimensional way. And uh, so, so at that time, I realized that design is a sensorial phenomena, meaning we do have to do good design that touches all our senses, all our five senses, taste, touch, smell, sight. So all of them uh, to, to experience at once. And, uh, and I did those two projects. And after that, I started doing uh, many, many uh, projects, interiors after that. And eventually I started to develop some buildings. And today, again, as I said, I'm kind of plural across the board, but my principles are the same. Now, what industrial design taught me was two things. One is that everything in this world has to function very, very well. And again, in interior spaces and interior design, and even in architecture, you know, you can go into an airport and find, get yourself lost, is we have to understand always and focus on the human experience firstly. Secondly comes the feelings, the forms, the, the messages of communication, what you want to say. That was number one. And when I say functional too, is you know, a lot of the things I do are very soft, very organic, uh, very kind of fluid. The reason is it's not driven from style. It's driven from the fact that I think as a human being, everything we touch or interface has to feel comfortable and feel good. If something is not something that we necessarily interface with, for example, we don't really interface with the structure of architecture, then we can be Cartesian, we can be severe, we can be hard, we can be minimal, all these things. But when it comes to the human touch, the human interface, I get very concerned about all the details of the interface and how something feels. So that was something that I brought from interior industrial design into interior design and even into architecture. I guess the second part I brought in, which was this notion of that when we do industrial design, 
we're very, very tight or frugal about details, about the way things are produced and the production methods and trying to make things that they're mass production, they have to be relatively inexpensive and using very advanced technologies. Well, what that teaches you really in a way is, is that even when you do an interior, you do architecture, if you think in a very economic way, you should be able to design in an economic way. And whereas mostly when I see interior work, there's a lot of extravagance. In fact, extravagance for the sake of extravagance, people spending money on certain things or furniture or details that really have very little meaning or relationship to us as human beings. So for me, I focus on that. But you can imagine if, for example, if you're doing a project that's a budget project, budget, let's say you're doing a budget, I do a lot of budget hotels across Europe. If I'm doing something that has very, I have very little money to play with, I have to think about how am I going to make the most comfortable, best, interesting human experience possible if, um, if uh, on, on a very low budget? How do you do that? You know? And so what it also taught me then, industrial design, was that there are materials out there and technologies out there and things out there that can be used that are not necessarily conventional, that actually could even bring a better experience. And I'll give you an example of it. So it was my about 20 years ago uh, on my third or fourth project, I decided I would design my own loft in New York. So the loft I designed, I put down the floor about what they, is a ballet floor. And a ballet floor is a vinyl polymer. <clears throat> it has a very thin, thin neoprene or foam under it. When you put it down on the ground and it's finished, you don't see any seams, unlike wood or tiles, um, and the beauty of not seeing any seams is you have a seamless floor. Second of all, these ballet floors, they were from one of the ones I was using was from Japan. They were in something like 60 colors. So I can make the floor any color I want. Thirdly, the maintenance is so easy and, and, uh, to, to clean and take care of. Fourthly, the material is acoustic. So you're absorbing sound. So if you're doing condominium, for example, and you walk to person or a hotel, then someone's not gonna hear you from the floor below or the floor above. So acoustics are very important, very important actually in things like restaurants too, which was very ill-considered when we designed. We don't really think about the acoustics as designers. We just, again, think about the physical and the visual. Um, but we need to think about sound. What I learned from a lot of using sort of interesting materials that aren't, let's say, conventional in interiors, I was finding materials that are more inexpensive to use and much higher performing. And I think our interiors in a way, and our whether it be a commercial or residential, should be up to speed and as competitive with our, let's say, physical and digital and technological world. What I mean by that is, you know, if I have a, a phone, mobile phone, uh, and I have a smartphone, I have an electric car, I have an electric car. So when I come into my residence, is my furniture, my objects, the wallpapers, the materials, are they as up to speed as that digital phone is? or the electric car is, or if I was to have any sports equipment, if I buy any sports equipment today, it's very extremely advanced. I wouldn't today, if I was gonna go play basketball, wear flat converse, or I wouldn't, if I was gonna play tennis today, use a wood racket, right? I'd probably use an alloy racket or aluminum alloy or titanium alloy, or I'd use something like carbon fiber racket. So with sports equipment and certain parts of our, let's say, lives, our objects and our things around us are very smart, very high performing, very technological. Even in the clothing industry, what's happening in the clothing industry, the movement of, of wearing, let's say, a sneaker, right? Is that in 1970, the sneaker um, business was less than 1% of the world's shoe production. Today, it's over 50% because we've entered what I call the age of casualism, the casual age. So the, we wear pants that have elastic stretch in them. We wear track pants, clothing. We wear jogging suits. We were, we were wearing all these kind of more high performance clothing because the world has changed drastically. Even if an object like the sink you're looking at now, I designed a, a sink now that's made of a silicone rubber so that when you actually interface with it, you're gonna shave or do your makeup, or put your elbow on the sink, it's soft instead of being a hard ceramic, which is the history that was always in porcelain or, or it was in stainless steel. So you wouldn't get also sound. When the water hits the sink of a silicone sink, it actually doesn't bounce, it just sort of stays. So you don't get a splash in while you're washing. 
Um, these sorts of considerations make for a better life and a better experience. These are in what you're looking at now, the bathtub, the sink, they're all made of silicone rubber. And I've been working with them for 20 years now. And finally, there's two companies in the world that are starting to produce silicone rubber sinks. It takes a long time. You know, sometimes my, my, um, uh, my culprit, my flaw in my life is the fact that I'm always thinking maybe too far ahead of the market because the reality is I think in general, the world is relatively conservative and very slow with progress. So it's, it takes its time to accept things. Um, I'm very impatient, so I don't wait for the world to take time to accept things. I just need to do things the way I believe makes sense, to, again, to move and evolve us forward. So when I talk about the softness of the sink, for example, I guess in a way, I'm, again, I'm talking about that notion of casualism, like the casual age. And the casual age is a very interesting time because we have dropped formalities. We've dropped, in a way, traditions. We're dropping, in a way, uh, rituals. But with those, we're developing new, new rituals, maybe even eventually new traditions. But what we are doing is we're making a far better world than we ever had before in history. We have technology to make, for example, this carpet that's totally up for outdoors that can last 20 years. Um, and we didn't have these technologies 15 years ago. So uh, this, we're looking at a carpet now. This is a new technology, digital produced wool carpets where we're cutting different heights of the carpets randomly. And this is similar to, and I think it's the most advanced technologies we have today are rapid prototyping. There's an office building in Dubai. Some of you might've seen it. It's completely made robotically produced by rapid prototyping. Once we can produce architecture or interiors by rapid prototyping, we won't be thinking about specifying a floor and then another material for the walls and then some sort of baseboard to connect the two and then something for the ceiling. But instead, we'll just have a machine and we're making really one surface. So when you make one surface, that floor inevitably is going to become that wall, which in turn is going to become that ceiling. So that we're starting in a way, we're going to start to produce economically really organic or what I would call techno organic interiors and architecture. And we've watched in the world of architecture in the last 15 years or so structures, more and more structures by many, by Massimilio Fuxas, Saha Hadi, my brother, Hany Rashid, many, many where we, we are seeing architects really taking an approach to trying to produce organic form and new form and new form. Why? For many, many reasons. One, to break the notion of the Cartesian grid, because the whole world since the Industrial Revolution has been kind of creating a grid that everything is Cartesian. The credit card was made Cartesian to fit into ATM machines. Um, the refrigerator was made Cartesian to make fit into kitchens. The kitchens are Cartesian to fit into the architecture. And we use sort of, let's say, um, quadratic uh, arch uh, form because it was economic. It grew out of the Industrial Revolution because it was the cheapest thing to make. It, the cheapest thing you can make is a straight plank of wood, right? So, um, but with new softwares, i.e. Grasshopper, many others, new technologies, we can start to shape new forms that have never been done before in history. The problem is that it's still incredibly expensive to build this kind of architecture, this kind of interior space. And um, unless you have an extremely high budget, there's no way you can produce a building, maybe like some of the buildings that Zaha had, had done, um, because they're at the end of the day, all made by hand. So it reminds me of the turn of the century or industrial design in the 1920s or something, when objects were made more out of hand than by machine, and then they were like soft and made to hold it to be held in your hand or felt. But as the technology grew, and we got injection molding or compression molding or roto molding, all these things that grew into architecture started to allow us like this kitchen to be able to do soft forms that are actually cost effective, that are not expensive at all. Um, and this is obviously, and we can do it with furniture uh, <clears throat> very easily. We can injection mold a very soft fluid chair, for example. But when it comes to the architecture, it's a different story. So it's, <clears throat> excuse me, the fuse sort of deposition technology. Could you please go a little back? Okay. 
So the, the fuse deposition technology, rapid prototyping, will start to allow us now to make the actual spaces sort of any form or anything we want. Um, the technology is also changing with lighting, for example. Today, until today, I'm asked to make a lighting fixture. I've made many lighting fixtures over the years for our team today and many others. But the question is, do we even nearly need a lamp anymore? Do we need a lighting fixture anymore? Because now light can all be built in to the architecture. And when it's built into the architecture, it becomes seamless. And the technology we have now, LED technology, which is beautiful technology and OLED, allows for very cost-effective, very inexpensive use of electricity, number one. And number two, it allows us to have lights of any lumens. We can have very warm light, very cool light, and we can have any shade or color or tint of light too. So this is, this is the, the new wave in a way <clears throat> that our spaces will become more seamless, that our architecture <clears throat> excuse me, will be the light itself. Excuse me, let me just get some water. I'm not saying that uh, we need to make everything organic by any means, <clears throat> but what I think as designers, what we all want to do as designers is to do some original things. And I think it's, how can you say, human nature, this desire to do something original. And let me just tell you all that are listening to me right now, if you do something original, you are one of 8 billion people, which is a fantastic phenomenon. Imagine just do some one thing original. You write an original song, you arrange original song, you write an original poetry, you design an original product, you paint an original painting. If you look, and if you're an artist or a designer or creative and you want to be pivotal, meaning make a mark in the world you live in now, you have to do something original. I, it took me many, many years to start to understand what I have to offer in the sense of originality. And I started to, with myself, after I would say imitating others, because we tend to copy to learn, it took me a good 10, 15 years working on my own before I really started to understand what I want to put into this world and how I want to contribute something original in this world. This is in Moscow, by the way, you probably know this space and this interior. So, um, and here, a lot of the things I do are to speak about the world in which we live in now. If I call the world today data-driven, does our spaces talk about data-driven technology, right? Because many of our things around us do talk about data-driven technology. If you look at an injection molded Nike running shoe that's made of four different polymers and the most comfortable, amazing uh, shoe and lightweight and all these things, I also feel that that's what we can be doing with our spaces. You know, it'd be beautiful tomorrow to sit on a couch that's as comfortable as a, as a really good sneaker, you know? And what I mean by comfort is it's not done in a traditional way. Maybe the fabric is completely, completely stain proof as an example, but we keep building and making things and archetypes and, that are being around in history for so long. And we just keep doing them over and over and over again. The, the couches in this project, as you can see there, they're a Turkish company. The fabric, actually, you can pour wine on it and it will not stain, it just wipes off. And I'm a big believer in these sort of new materials and new technologies, because why? It makes life just better and easier and simpler and and, um, and that's the kind of world that's, uh, that we should uh, be constructing. And with that said, you know, the fear of technology, obviously, is that we start to believe that we're pulling away far from nature. First of all, I will say that moving forward technologically is nature because we are nature and we are creating the technology, number one. So technology is not by any means, not an extension of nature. Number two is, is that, <clears throat> that the, the, this is the way that I think human existence will move regardless. And what I mean by that is, is that we are here on this earth somehow to shape our evolution, to advance us, to be able to get on an airplane and fly from New York to Paris in two or three hours, to be able to get on an airplane that's now made 75% plastic polymer, so it's lightweight, so it takes one third the amount of fuel. Maybe we'll be one day flying in electric airplanes as we are now with cars. 
So I think these are very normal um, um, evolutions, let's say, of, of, of creativity, really. And everything that's driving us in a sense of progress and, and, and evolution is, is our creativity. And we've been given the power, the, 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 uh, the mental capacity to create. So I would say to exist is to create, to be is to create, or to create is to be. And to do something original, as I was telling all of you, is it's a very hard task in a way. You know, it's, it's, it's a very difficult thing today to do something original, also because so much has been done. But if you focus on that notion of really informing form, and what I say by informing form means to think about the criteria that will shape something. You know, think about the materials, technologies, the colors, the, the feelings, the, the experience, the human interaction, the, the anthropometrics of the body, the ergonomics of the body. If we can't focus on those things, we start to shape really new form and new ideas. And, uh, and that's how you can actually start to reach uh, something and do something original. When we look at the history of humankind, we study it by styles, correct? So we think, oh, we had the Baroque style, we had Belle Epoque style, we had the neoclassical style, we had classical style, we had brutalist style, we had, you know, um, minimalist style, all these, these styles are what we call style. By the way, these are what you're looking at now, sorry, just to go quickly, are, these are budget hotels that cost 39, 49 euro to stay, and I have no money to make them, so I don't even put a door on the closet. I have to leave everything exposed. Um, the, 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 I love working in that kind of budget realm and using also materials that are completely biodegradable or sustainable. But let me go back to <clears throat> doing something pivotal in this world. All the styles that have existed, they at one time were not styles. They were movements. So when a column was made, a Corinthian column, at one point, that was a movement of a new way of creating a column. Today, we, a Corinthian column is, if we borrow it and we put it on the facade of an architecture, it's just style. It's really decoration at the end of the day. And the question here is, is do we, when we design, are we designing or are we styling? Or are we doing a combination of both? If you look at the history of, of design, and you look at a chair by Alva Alto, for example, uh, in the 1930s, where he bent plywood in two dimensions, he was in a, saw a factory that bent plywood in, in tubes for the sewage pipes in Finland. And he thought, maybe I can make a chair out of that technology. So he used the same mold because he didn't have money to create new molds. And he shaped, took the pieces of plywood, joined them, and eventually made a chair that became pivotal, very important chair in the history of design. If you look at Charles Eames, Herman Miller in 1952 created bending plywood now not in 2D but in 3D and in turn the Charles the Eames chairs grew out of that technology and that's why those chairs became very important and pivotal to the history of design if you look at uh, the ghost chair by Philip Stark it was designed uh, by cartel it was the first polycarbon all polycarbon injection molded chair if you look back, there's a chair in 1947 in Canada. It was the first injection molded monoblock chair. All these objects that we know of, that we look up to in history, we're not looking at them in history because of style or their form. We're looking at them because they were innovation, technological innovation. And that's what made them pivotal. That's what made them have a huge impact on human life and evolve us. So if you design a chair tomorrow, you should think about that too. Can you embrace some new technology to help form or inform the form of the chair? Then maybe you will make a pivotal chair that will also leave a footprint, leave a fingerprint on this earth. And so, you know, what your contribution here is, if you're even gonna do a space or an interior, is what is your contribution that's different than any other designer? Now, if we just go along with status quo and we go along with style, first of all, you'll never do anything original. And second of all, what you're doing when you're styling is you're copying the past. This is, by the way, another budget hotel. This, this room, the entire room here 
including everything, bathroom, kitchen, uh, sorry, a bathroom, television, carpeting, everything was 4,000 euro per room. They call the price hotel. It's a um, <clears throat> great challenge. It afforded me to really, in a way, do something that's bordering on new or original by trying to work in extremely tight budgets and yet make a pleasant, functional, good human experience. Um, so uh, so there, there's your contribution is to, to say, well, I'm on this earth for a certain period of time. Could I do something and contribute something that's deep from within me? And when you say, when I say within you, I said, you know, because I was very interested many years ago, 20 years ago, in playing with Photoshop and Illustrator and doing patterns. I was doing lots of patterns. I used to sit on airplanes for hours playing on my laptop, making patterns. I call those patterns digipop. They're kind of like pop art, but using digital tools. But what that afforded me as digital tools was to make patterns that never could exist before in history. So when I make ornament, decoration, those patterns for me, the relationship is to do patterning that's maybe more three-dimensional instead of two-dimensional and that speak about the digital tools and the digital information age. So for example, the floor here that's printed, it's not even printed. The way the ceramic tiles are done, which are almost like screened, is also a new technology or I could never ever get these kind of patterns before in history. So and they allow me to speak about what I believe is a time in which I live in. Now, you would have a different interpretation, maybe, of the time you live in. But the point here is, is that these sorts of ornament decoration is that I'm trying to speak about now, but the year I live in now, not about the past at all. And I believe the past is pointless. And I believe the last thing we should do as designers is perpetually look in the past. And, uh, and I think we do far, far, far too much of this. So now... Here's the question. When you design a space, are you styling it or are you designing it? If you're designing it, there's so many things to think about. I mentioned many of them already. Technologies, materials, new materials, new ways of social behaviors. You know, these chairs, for example, were perfect during COVID for, for distancing. Um, you know, uh, this notion of trying to give people private space in a public space. Uh, trying to bring comfort to this to the to the place they're in, trying to inspire. I do a lot of my spaces are very much to make you feel alive, to inspire you. So when you wake up in the morning to go for breakfast, you feel alive. You know, you feel inspired, and you realize that you exist. This is the what they call a phen phenomenology, the study of phenomenology. When you have a hyper awareness that you are alive. And how do you feel you are alive? You know, if you taste some taste that you've never tasted before, or you look at someone's eyes that you've never seen that kind of expression before, or you smell something that's new to you, or that you, you know, or you you dive into some body of water where the water feels very different than what you're used to. These are phenomena, right? These are um, unveilings of actualities. When you unveil an actuality like that, it's really making you realize that right now your part is pumping through all your veins and you are alive. And I travel the world and try to see and embrace things that inspire me that make, can make me feel this way, to feel really alive. But what I see a lot in the built environment instead is I see just this repetition over and over again, the derivative appropriation of all styles being repeated over and over and over. And I think we have a responsibility to evolve and move humanity forward. So um, with that said, again, you have to search. You see the floor here on this one. This, the floor in the last image was, uh, is a biodegradable wood material. It's printed with aniline dye prints has a 20 year warranty and is so inexpensive and snaps together with no nails, no, no glue. And uh, it's a technology I found in Germany 13 years ago and I've now used it in many projects on many floors. And I think these are what makes, let's say the spaces I do and the things I do special. Now, I'm not saying again, 
that my work is necessarily uh, you know, the way for every designer to go, not at all. What I am saying is to embrace again, the time in which we live, this information age. And what is information to all of you? If you could right now, you had eyeglasses and you can put them on and you could see information, what would it look like to you? And for me, what are the patterns I do are what I would call, let's say, decoration of the day in which I live. Now, if, if you think about decoration in general, you know, you know, prints of flowers or stripes or checker or all these things, they've been around for centuries and centuries and centuries. But I always question, I question the fashion industry this way. Where is the decoration of today? What is the decoration of today? Uh, and so these, these are the, 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 let's say the, how can I say that? The, the messages that I want to communicate when I design. So if tomorrow you're asked to do a restaurant and someone says to you, well, the client says, oh, it's, I don't know, it's Chinese food. And you decide to make it Chinese, let's say traditional, like, in other words, you start researching, you know, let's say Chinese architecture or interior space or Chinese furniture things, and you start to kind of copy or imitate that, you're really not contributing or doing anything, really, in a way. You're not really doing anything original. And I, I will be very honest, the interior design profession is in trouble. And the reason it's in trouble is because it's becoming easier and easier to do. My nine and a half year old daughter can design now, she has three apps, and she designs interiors, and she does a great job at it. She specifies, picks the chairs, drags them into a space, does floor plans, and, and it's so easy to do now. And there are actually, to the point of AI, where it's actually maybe done by someone else and not by you, is that if we want to continue our profession, we need to offer something that is that others would not do or think of. And we definitely cannot just keep repeating the past. Now, the big question with everything I'm saying is, and I'm sympathetic to this, how do you get clients to understand this? How do you, how do you motivate a client to do something progressive? or something very much about today and not about yesterday. It's a very difficult task. You know, as much as I show you a lot of work that I've done, it's amazing how many jobs I do not do or do not get because of the fear of the language and what I do. Fear of color. The world is so afraid of color. It's shocking to me because color is a beautiful phenomena and our eyes can perceive, you know, something like up to a, a million different tints and hues of color it's incredible and actually every color that we can perceive exists in nature no there are no colors that are artificial colors so if you really look deep into nature you see the most beautiful things on birds insects reptiles the colors are amazing but for some reason the world sort of interprets nature in brown and beiges or maybe dark greens because of trees. So we're only looking at a very broad, or some maybe blue because of the ocean, but we're looking at some very broad and very dull colors. The hotel room I'm sitting in right now in Istanbul is a brand new hotel, and every tone in the hotel is in the in browns or warm grays. And you know this is a big fear. So if you're a designer and you have a client and you start showing them some work that's maybe strong, colorful form, they'll probably run away, right? So the question is, how do you convince them to move forward with these kind of ideas? Well, the first thing I think that I did in my career was to basically have integrity and keep sticking with what I do, that I, what I really believe in. With that said, in design, there's always some compromise, of course. So a lot of the spaces you're looking at now probably were, were filled with compromises, frankly. You know, so many changes, changes, uh, compromise of the fear of certain colors, the fear of, you know, certain, let's say, language, the fear of certain materials, the fear of, uh, um, how can I say, um, uh, uh, or the, the, the budget, for example, or an onward and onward, right? So, but there's a way of taking and, and getting across still your ideas and keeping maybe 70% of your integrity and making that 30% compromise. But I'll let you in in a little secret what I do a lot. A lot of times when I'm designing, I let the client think that it's the client's ideas, not mine. 
So I sort of throw it back at the client and say, you know, when you said to me, are you like, you know, and I try to make the client engaged in the development because when the client's engaged in development, they have a certain, let's say, ego and pride that they were part of shaping the space. And so I think that's one of the approaches. But, you know, I will admit to you, I've lost hundreds of jobs and many, many products that I've developed never went to production because of the fear of doing something that's unusual, that's new, that's innovative. And, uh, and so we have a tough profession that way. But, you know, part of our responsibility, you could argue, is to educate. So we have to educate the people that are around us. We always tend to forget that if I'm designing a building and I'm working for a developer, that developer generally is worried about finance. All they really care about is making a profit. So they're not, they don't have your education. They don't have your, let's say, sensibility. They don't have your vision. So they are just, um, let's say, in the sense of, they're not necessarily very creative. So you have to kind of bring them in and lasso them in and explain to them why you do what you do. And the best way you can do that is just to be very rational. You know, you say things that are very functional. If you talk about function all the times, you can get away with doing crazy things. So just make everything very, very functional to begin with. And reductive. Now, this is the next thing I just want to talk about a little bit. You know, minimalism is a movement that kind of, you could argue, ended in the, in the 60s. And minimalism was about using pure geometry, only pure geometry. So everything was based on cone, cylinder, cube, rectangle. But you can make minimalism in a soft way too. And what really I think minimalism today is, not as a style, but as a movement, is to have less. Less is more, as Mies van der Rohe said, or less is better, as Dieter Ram said, that we have less in our lives, but what we do have is strong, powerful, beautiful, functional, soft, engaging, experiential, human. And if we always think of the human being at the center of our projects, you know, I'm showing you a hotel now in Greece, right? Well, I noted that every time I look at hotels online, when I'm trying to stay at a hotel, they always show a picture of a bed, right? And they never show really people. But really, we design all this for people. But we all the photographs are void of people. Look at these photographs now. Not a soul, right? But this is about human experience. There has to, you know, people are going to be moving through this space. So we need to communicate that. And we need to, when we design, think about that these spaces are made for human beings. So in other words, let's make the human as the epicenter, as the nucleus of our projects. Think human think humanized and what is the human today the human today lives in a new age a digital age the new human today lives in a hyper communicative age the human today lives in a way hands-free age faucets you don't need to touch them the water can come on by themselves the human today is used to better and better experiences so make the experiences better human today is used to a certain ease plug and play mentality if you walk into a hotel, you should be able to immediately be able to, I don't know, just use voice control to turn the music on, turn the television on, shut the curtains, these sorts of things. They still, this technology is also inexpensive and so accessible, but I don't see it anywhere. I do not see us as designers embracing and engaging these very simple uh, 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 technologies of, let's say, uh, communication. So can, you know, that's the, these are the things that we can contribute to do something original too. So doing something original isn't necessarily visual or necessarily physical. Doing something original is to make an original human experience. So we can, we should really sort of focus on that. And what else today to make it, to be human centric? Human centric is to think about how our social behaviors are. You know, do we gather now in groups? Are we more isolated? Um, you know, these, these sorts of things, you, the human being in a sense of nurturing the human being, we need good daylight, we need light that really works well for us. Um, human being in, in a sense of, of being human centric is that you, you know, ideally, if you design an airport tomorrow, that you try to make a plan that has the shortest span of walking 
from one gate to the next or one terminal to the next, et cetera. Can, can we make those things more um, simpler, easier, better? And, you know, we're traveling around the world. This is what we want. If tomorrow I had the opportunity to design some airplane interiors, you know, the interiors are not designed to be human at all, actually. They're still designed like old buses or trains. And I think we could redo it in a very, very different way. So to me, this is all design. Design even goes beyond this, as we know, because design is about branding. It's about services. It's about, um, uh, yeah, the service industry. It's about transportation. It, it's a very broad, beautiful field where really, again, if we just focus on making the world a better place, if we were smart about every material we use is either biodegradable or recyclable in our spaces and in our interiors, are we doing that? Is Are we designing um, for function and utility. Like for example, I'm designing a hospital now in, uh, in Tel Aviv, in Israel. And the materials I used have to be incredibly high performing, but also they have to be uh, hygienic. They have to be easy, very, very easily cleaned, et cetera. So you need to, when you make a hospital, you need to make it very minimal, simple, but minimal in a very beautiful way as possible. You know, the, the agenda of the hospital is to make you better. So if you have a designer who's doing a hospital, the agenda there should be you to make people feel mentally better. Because if you're in a good positive mental condition, there is a good chance that you may heal biologically or physically too. And those two things are not by any means inseparable. We know how stress can take a toll on our physical body. So we also know that making a positive space can do the opposite, right? can improve our well-being. Um, we can design kitchens, see the back there, they're so easy to clean. There's no, you know, top surface, back surface. I always honestly hated in architecture and in, in design, all these different materials that are used in a singular space. You know, I go into, I go into restaurants and I see people hanging lamps and decoration and mirrors and, and ornament and different chairs and, and the, the amount, this is not minimalism at all, the amount of that is really um, irrelevant in a way and, and unnecessary. And it's not necessarily gonna shape a better experience. If anything, the more there is in space, the worse the human experience is. I'm a believer that the more you have in your life, the worse, meaning the less you have, the better. So, and we know that we're moving and we have to move to save this planet we're going to move in a way that, that uh, it's going to be about consuming far less. So if we're gonna consume less, also can't our spaces have less within them? Because you know, all these objects, and there was a French philosopher that taught me this many, many years ago. Let me take a quick sip of coffee. There was a French philosopher named Jean Baudrillard and he wrote about how objects in our daily lives are obstacles of living. Now, isn't that it's sort of sad in a way when you think about it, that a lot of these things are not bringing us a better life. They're actually just becoming in the way of our lives. They're just obstacles for the sake of obstacles because somebody decided to decorate rather than design. So I always, I always thought about this. I thought, well, then can I, if I have objects in space, can they be more like raptures of beauty and raptures of a better experience instead of becoming obstacles? And I think this is something to consider moving forward, you know, and to, to really consider that a sort of sense of less in a space, but better lighting, maybe a higher ceiling, maybe more simpler surfaces, maybe less decoration, but softer. I think all that could bring us far, far more in a, in a better world than loading and filling up space for the sake of it. So going back to that notion of decorating versus or styling versus designing, let's talk about that for a moment. If I design now, I use all the contemporary or let's say the present issues or criteria, right? So I'm designing a subway station, for example, I think about everything that I really have to solve in that, those spaces. Now that's design. 
Just like if I designed a mobile phone, I would right now have to think about the latest technologies, the latest materials, the latest interface. And with that said, I'm never looking back. There's nothing to look back at. 30 years ago, we didn't have a mobile phone. So we're not looking to copy history. We're looking to make the next evolution of what it, the archetype is now. So if you think about that, well, we do the same thing, let's say with a space. Do we now sort of do the next evolution of the space or do we go back and look back into history and copy? Here's a simple example. If a client said to me tomorrow, design a Baroque-like sofa. Right? The minute they say Baroque-like, they're referring to a certain time in history. Then the designer will go and have to go look at Baroque, right? Now they may do something that's sort of styled from that period, but bring some, something new or innovative to it. That's a possibility, right? That's like remixing music. Take an old song and you remix it. The other approach is to say, okay, no, forget the word Baroque-like and say, design a couch that's about today. And a couch today, it's about holding an iPad while you're lying down on it, or maybe two people lying side by side or from each other and with an iP with a laptop in their hand. So is there a USB plug in the couch? Is it designed for that behavior of today? Or are we going and making a couch based on an archetype of a couch has been around for 100 years. So the world, you know, the world is full of archetypes and I think the majority of us see the world in these archetypes, but we have responsibility to not only break the archetypes, but do things that are relevant for now. And if you look at history, uh, many times there was innovation and change. If I look at, uh, at, at housing in America, okay, in New York City, brown brick, uh, four-story housing was had windows and the window panes had little mullions, little a grid a mullion. And why? Because each piece of glass, float glass at that time, the maximum you could make a float glass was something like 30 centimeters by 20 at the turn of the century, 1900. Today you can make glass, float glass, one sheet, three meter by four meter, standard, right? Not custom. So today, if you're going to make a building, wouldn't you use the three meter by four meter piece of glass instead of using the little glass? 100 years ago to 200 years ago, 20 years, the brick was really a new technology to stack bricks like the pyramids were done. You could argue it's 3000 years old, really. Um, so that was sort of, let's say the latest technology. We didn't have other technologies to build houses or we had wood, et cetera, a few things, a few materials. But today, what is the technology to build a house? So, we should be working in the time in which we exist, in which we live. And uh, so that's really, you know, my, my, my message today is exactly that, is that to shape a, a world that, remember, if you design something now, right? If I design a building now, it's going to take four years to build. And then for the next maybe 100 years, people will live in it. So I have to design for the future. I, I design now to shape the future. But if I make a building now that's already trying to look like it was well, from 100 years ago or using materials or technologies from 100 years ago, the building, as when it's built, it's already even dated. So I think this is critical to, to, to consider and think about. Um, so the, the last thing I'll say about all this is that the, this, this, uh, uh, for me, there's a fine line, and I think this is what we need to focus on trying to do something that's moving us forward, but at the same time, managing to get something produced. Because at the end of the day, us designers, we all want to see something realized, right? We want to see the manifestation of our ideas and our work. So with that, of course, there's a back and forth, as I said before, with the client. And I think this is important, is to sort of not only educate, but move the brand or the company or the client forward, because that's why they came to you in the first place. Okay, with that said, that's the end of my talk. And I think we're going to do some questions and answers. I'm not really sure if we are or not. Um, so, spasiba, uh, thank you very much, everybody. Uh, thank you for allowing me to have this moment with you.
uh, we can let the images run as, as we do the question and answer, if you would like. Thank you.